what you have to remember is that life is just way too short to be spending your time on things that aren't worthwhile. And you need to quit those things to go do things that are. Because overall, that's really what our long-term goal is, right? Is not to like grit out some horrible thing that's making us unhappy for no reason other than we think it builds character. It's to get us to somewhere, you know, that resembles a fulfilling and happy life. And so, look, if the thing you're doing is hard, but, you know, ultimately it's, it's going to get you closer to that goal of a fulfilling and happy life, you should be able to stick it out. But if it's not, you have to switch as quickly as possible because you don't have that much time. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. Thanks, Niels, and welcome, everyone. Um, so if you're a professional investor, if you manage your own money, if you're just trying to follow the markets, you're grappling with the problem of making decisions under uncertainty. And our guest today, Annie Duke, makes her living helping people get good at this. And she got um, exceptionally good at this herself um, over the course of a 20-year career as a professional poker player. Um, she has career winnings of over $4 million. She won the first ever World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions. She's the only woman to have won that competition and the NBC National Poker Heads Up Championship. Uh, when she retired in uh, 2012 from poker, she became a decision strategist consulting and writing about learning under uncertainty. Um, she's written a lot of books. The uh, most written, uh, most recent of those, uh, Thinking in Bets, became a national bestseller. And we're recording this on October 3rd, the day before the release of her latest book called Quit, The Power of of knowing when to walk away. And uh, the messages and themes from that book are what we're going to talk about today. So, um, Annie Duke, uh, welcome to the Ideas Lab. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, and I, I, I really just wanted to say um, how much we appreciate you having on the show, especially today, because I know you've got the book coming out tomorrow. <laughs> I, I have to say, um, yes. So, it's a little crazy, Um and, you know, Kevin, the, the thing is, like, you know, I think people imagine who don't write books, and maybe this is for other people who aren't me, that um, it's just really cool. Like, you've done the book, you finished it, you turned it in, you've done all the editing, you you know. And now it's just, ooh, excitement, because the book is going to be released into the world. And, um, I, I mean, at least for me, it, that's, it's, it's actually, um, it's very stressful, because the way that I'd like to put it is like you think about different identities that you might have, right? And one identity you can have is I'm writing a book. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, if you were talking to somebody at a cocktail party and they were like, I'm writing a book, you'd be like, they're cool, <laughs> right? <You'd> like, <laughs> that's a cool thing. You'd be like, oh, I wish I had written a book, you know? Um, you you know, you sort of like admire them and, you know, whatnot. And um, that's like, it's it's an interesting thing because... The pro when you're writing a book, it's just great. 
But when you're releasing a book, when the book is actually getting released into the world, it's now like running down the street naked. It's like, okay, before I was writing a book and you thought it was really cool and I gave you the elevator pitch, which is what sold the book, but you haven't actually read anything that's in the book. There's nothing to critique. There's nothing for you to reject. There's nothing for you to whatever, you know, give a bad review about. And when you release it into the book, then you're just exposed. Like there's no, there's no take backsies. (laughs) And um, so anyway, yeah. So this it's, uh, I've been feeling it for sure. Definitely like this weekend today, I'm a little bit holding my breath until tomorrow. I imagine I'll be holding my breath for about the first week. Just kind of and, wait, waiting for for the reactions, even though you know yeah. you, you've put so much work and you know a lot of the lessons really from a, a multi decade career are in this, but you're still yeah. Thinking, I mean, exactly. I mean, I think I think it's um, you know, it doesn't matter how much you're you're sort of talking yourself into like, but I did a good job and my editor likes it and I've seen some reviews and they've been good. It's still this really big moment of exposure. And in an ideal world, you wouldn't care. Because in reality, I write these books for myself because I, I want to learn about the topics. But it's just sort of like a, a, a part of that is that it does end up other people see what's been sort of like grinding around in your brain, you know? And um, it's a moment. Like that, it's a moment. So, you know, obviously this isn't, this is not my first rodeo. I've decided that I can, I can withstand this moment just fine. But, uh, but the day before and the day of is always, it's always, it's always a moment. So you caught me on that during that moment, Kevin. Well, I, like I said, I, we, we appreciate you, you know, you talking to us during, during what I know is a stressful time. And I, I you know, I, I think it's, that's a nice way for you to start off because, you know, like you said, this isn't your first rodeo yet. You still have these you know, the uncertainties. And I think uh, we, we all can uh, relate to that. So it, it, let's, let's get to the book. I mean, you, um, there's a lot of really great stories that you've put together, great narratives to illustrate the points that, that you want to get across. But I, mean, I thought maybe before we get into those stories, if we could just start with what, what are the main messages and points you, you really hope that people take away from this? Well, I mean, let, let's just start simple, which is that, I mean, let me ask you this, right? Like, so if I called you a quitter, would you take it as a compliment? Unlikely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the, the, really, I mean, if I think about what the broad message is, it's like, why? Because there, there are clear, there are clear circumstances in which quitting has to be correct. You know, like I, I can come up with some of them. Like you're playing a football game and you get a concussion. Shouldn't you quit? Um, you know, you're climbing a mountain and there's a snowstorm. Shouldn't you quit? Uh, you know, you you have an investment that's very quickly going to zero. Like, shouldn't you quit somewhere along the way? You know, and and I'm not saying that you should quit just because the investment's going down. It's that's obviously a question of do I believe this is going to win in the future or not? But uh, if you don't believe it's going to win anymore, you shouldn't be doing it. And I think that as a society, you know, when we think about that opposition of grit versus quit, grit is a virtue. I mean, so much so that when when we think about like the way that we parent our children, we tell them not to quit things because we want to build character. It's like synonymous with character. Um, whereas quitters are losers. They're failures. And... I think that that's just like a huge shame. I mean, that's the main message that I'm trying to get across in the book is that quitting is a good thing when applied at the right time. Grit is not always good. It's really good for sticking you to things that are worthwhile, but that are also hard. But the problem is that grit is also really good at getting you to stick to things that aren't worthwhile, just because you sort of think that quitting is bad and sticking to things is good. And if we don't rehabilitate this idea of quitting, we're going to be in really big trouble because it's it's a really important skill to get good at and develop in order to be a great decision maker. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I, I've been yeah, you know, I've been really looking forward to speaking with you and kind of telling people about. Uh, you know, I'm interviewing Annie Duke. She's a former champion poker player. She's you know consults with companies on decision making. People are like, oh, that's that's super cool. You know, when's the uh, episode coming out and what's she going to talk about? And I said, well, she's going to talk about how we should quit more often. And they're like, Oh, 
well, she's what? wrong. <laughs> but, right. Yeah, but, yeah, but send, exactly. send me the link anyway. Um, but uh, so let's, you know, early on in the book, you talk about one of the reasons why we kind of, you know, quit is seen as a vice or we need to rehabilitate um, the idea of quitting is that we don't, we don't see the quitters. They're, they're kind of invisible. And you, um, you, you illustrate that with the story about um, a climbing, you know, incident, accident, on on Everest that happened that ended up becoming quite famous. I was wondering if you could recount that for us, because I think not only does it show how people who kind of quit at the right time ended up becoming a footnote, um, sort of invisible, but also that the powerful forces that drive even the most experienced people to keep going when they shouldn't to to quit too late. Yeah. So you know, I think I think I say. If you're going to write a book about grit, you should probably include climbing Mount Everest because that takes a lot of grit. Uh, and so I think it's only fair that if you're going to write a book about quitting, you should also start on Mount Everest, uh, which is what I do with this book. And um, so this story about Mount Everest it, it features uh, the stars. The heroes of this story are three climbers, Dr. Stuart Hutchinson, Dr. Uh, Lucas Itsky and John Tasky. And um, so they're, they're part of a climbing expedition. You know, they, you know this, they've gotten very popular, right? So this is in the 90s when everybody's climbing Everest. Uh, and the, this expedition is led by a very experienced expedition leader. There's like three Sherpas and then there's eight climbers. And these three climbers become friends. They're part of this same expedition and they're heading up the mountain. So on summit day, they're starting out from camp four and one of the things that they do on Everest is when you're climbing, they give you a turnaround time. So a turnaround time, simply put, is is just a time that no matter where you are on the mountain, uh, is supposed to you're supposed to turn around even if you haven't reached your final destination. Uh, and it's meant to really protect you from the very bad decision making you can make when you're in the middle of the climb. Because when you're in the middle of the climb, you might be suffering from all sorts of things like hypoxia, for example, which is going to uh, just lack of oxygen, which is going to affect your climb. And also when you get in the shadow of the summit, you know, we've all heard of summit fever, this desire to just get there no matter what, because it's just right there, no matter what the conditions are, that's actually really dangerous. Um, and and you, you know, you don't want to be continuing. Like, first of all, you don't want to continue just like if there's bad conditions, like a snowstorm or whatever. But also, you don't want to continue past the turnaround time because if you do, you're going to end up descending the mountain in the darkness. And not only in the darkness, but when you're tired, like when you're going up and you're trying to reach your destination, you have lots of adrenaline, you have lots of oxygen. Then on the way down, that's when you start to really suffer the adverse effects of just fatigue and, um, you know, lack of oxygen, and you might be in the darkness. And, and dark is really bad when you're climbing on Everest. So the turnaround time on summit day is 1 p.m. So what that means is I don't care where you are on the mountain. I don't care whether you've reached the summit or not. If it's 1 p.m., you got to turn around and come back. So Hutchinson, Tasky, and Kasitsky are climbing up the mountain, and it happens to be particularly slow. So they're caught behind just a clump of people who are moving really slowly because the mountain's really crowded. Remember, this is when, you know, it started to get very popular to climb Everest. And so their expedition leader comes up behind them and Hutchinson says to the expedition leader, how long is it going to be till the summit? Just sort of recognizing that they were moving slowly. And the expedition leader says three hours. So it's taking three hours to get to the summit from where they're standing. The expedition leader then scrambles ahead. Uh, and goes in front of them. Hutchinson holds Tasky and Kasitsky back and says, hmm, I think we have a problem because it's almost 1130 in the morning. And if it's going to be three hours till we get to the summit, we're not going to get there till 2.30 p.m. And the turnaround time for summit day, we have been told, is 1 p.m. So I don't see any world in which we get to the summit before 1 p.m. Like even if we were to go to really fast, like maybe we'd get there at 2. So I, I think we should turn around now. So um, basically, like Tasky agrees right away. Kasitsky was a little bit tougher just because he he had the goal to climb all seven of the tallest mountains in the world. It's called the Seven Summits. And Everest was his last one. Uh, but they did actually get, they did convince him and he turned around. And they went back to Camp 4. 
And that's the end of the story. So, uh, Kevin, I assume it's immediately obvious to you, like, why you don't know who these people are. <laughs> it's, it's like not a particularly like, you know, where's where's the tension, right? Where's the right. plot line? Uh, they were climbing. They followed the rules. They turned around at 1130 in the morning because they realized they weren't going to make it to the summit by one. And then they lived. These people are not the heroes of any story, at least not ones that we read. But the thing is that they should be the heroes of the story because they did follow the rules and they turned around when they ought to. And the interesting thing about them, as much as when I tell the story, people are like, never heard of them. It turns out that most people actually have heard of them. They just don't remember them. And the reason is that these people were part of the expedition that was chronicled in Into Thin Air, John Krakauer's book. They were part of the documentary um, uh, that was made called Everest, the the movie that was made uh, that starred Jake Gyllenhaal, I think, uh, called Everest. And... um, their expedition leader was Rob Hall, who people might remember died on the mountain. He got he got to the summit at 2 p.m. He was the one who told them it was going to be three hours to the summit. He got there at 2 p.m. He waited there for two hours for another client, Doug Hansen, uh, until 4 p.m. And then both of them perished. They never got down off the summit, um, and you know which was the tragedy. But when we think about the like the protagonists of the story, it's you know Rob Hall and Doug Hansen. Um, are the protagonists of the story. And we don't really remember these three people, but Krakauer actually talks about them. He says quite a bit about them and they, he calls them the best decision makers on the mountain that day. Mm-hmm. But they're invisible to us. We don't remember them. Where's, where? you know, because the, the people who stick to it are the heroes of our stories, not the ones who just turn around. We don't, we don't, know, we don't know who they are. Yeah, it, it struck me that there's there's a lot, there's a lot in there. I mean, the the first thing that popped in my mind, you know, just because I've got an investment background, is that well, the turnaround time is a stop loss order. Um, mm-hmm. you know, exactly and, right. You know, and, or, or what I call so I put those stop loss orders, turnaround times. I put them under the category of kill criteria, and kill criteria really simply put are, uh, like generally either a signal or a state that you could be in at a particular point in time. Um, that would tell you that you ought to stop, that you think about well in advance. So a stop loss order is not something where you just kind of do it on the fly. It's like you open the position and then you put in a stop loss at that time in advance, um, which is what obviously a turnaround time is in as well. Yeah. So that they're totally related to each other. They're in the same category of strategies for being better at quitting. Yeah. And, and you know, you talk about how when you're you know, setting the stop limit or you're setting the kill criteria, you need to you need to draw on history. You need to reference people who've done it before. And obviously the, the Everest turnaround time is kind of a great example of that. Presumably that's been built up over time based on years of mm-hmm. experience. I wanted to I, I just I kind of ask you about that because um, I, I, was, as I, was th- I was thinking about that, and that makes sense, right? A lot of people in, in the investment world, you know, the same thing. We'll set stops based on, you know, the, the past, um, let's say, you know, volatility of a particular asset, mm-hmm. um, things like that. Um, but is, is, do you think there's some value in, how do I want to put it, like learning the lesson the hard way, like instead of, <laughs> <laughs> do you know no. what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't. And okay. the reason why I don't think so is because even if you put in a stop loss, you're going to learn the lesson in a, the hard way because you're going to cancel the thing, which I bet you you've done in your life. So, uh, <laughs> right. You see, you're laughing, but I know because <laughs> you convince yourself, right? You're like, oh, well, I thought that then, but now I know something different. And then you cancel it. Um, yeah. So the thing is, look, here, here's here's the question that we have in terms of learning the lesson the hard way is let's say that we do have a bad outcome that comes from from quitting too late. Question number one is, are we going to learn the lesson? Right? So when that happens to us, and then we're, we go into the future, and we're in an experience where something's free falling, or there's some new information that's come in uh, that tells us that our original thesis wasn't even right, are we going to pay attention to those signals? Right? And the answer, and I think that this is the Rob Hall lesson, tells us really clearly is no. Because if Rob Hall, who's one of the most experienced alpinists in the whole world, didn't pay attention to his own turnaround time, then I don't think that we should trust ourselves to actually pay attention to these things. Actually, there's another climbing story that I think shows this really well. There was this researcher, Jeffrey Rubin, 
who did a whole bunch of research on what's called escalation of commitment or or in getting entrapped, uh, which just has to do with like very simple example, like you're waiting in a line at a grocery store and you're, you, your line starts to move really slowly and you see there's another line that's moving a lot faster. You don't switch, right? Because it's like, this is my line and I don't want to have wasted the time that I'll spend in the, the line, even though it would be correct to switch. So he did a whole bunch of work and he was actually one of the the, you know, along with Barry Staw on the motivational side of things, one of the uh, people who had the most expertise in these problems of escalating commitment to losing causes, not reacting to the signals the world is giving you that, hey, I ought to be quitting. So he's an expert in this. He's climbing, That he's doing like the 100 highest peaks in New England, climbing, I think his last one, um, and a very heavy fog rolls in. He's climbing with a graduate student of his. The graduate student says, oh, it seems really bad. Like the, the fog is really awful and heavy. I don't think we should continue. He insists on keeping going. The graduate student turns around and Jeffrey Rubin died on the mountain. His body was found two days later. This is an expert in these problems. So what are you going to learn the hard way? Because the fact is that we have the intuition that when the world starts turning against us, right, when those signals start coming in that that uh, the thing that we started is no longer worth continuing, that we will quit. But we don't. We keep sticking to it Why? for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is like we're not quitters. And your friend said, oh, she's wrong about wanting people to quit more because grit is good and we stick to things and whatever, and we don't like to admit we're wrong. So for that reason alone, I don't think you're supposed to learn the hard way, but you're going to learn the hard way anyway, because Rob Hall's the one who set the turnaround time, right? right? And he didn't follow it. So what we need to realize about these things like stop losses or turnaround times or, or kill criteria in general is that they, what they're doing is increasing the probability that you'll, you'll quit when you should. That's what they're doing. They're not giving you a guarantee that you will. So we know that these three climbers would not have lived without a turnaround time. So they followed it, of all, right? But not everybody followed the turnaround time on the mountain that day. But three more people did gotcha. than I otherwise see. would have, right? So that's the other thing is that you need to realize is, trust me, you're going to run headlong into that. And hopefully the next time you do, you're going to be more likely to actually follow the, the turnaround time that you've set your, for yourself, which in this case might be a stop loss. Um, but that's the thing that we have to remember. Like, no, it, the hard knocks isn't going to get you there. You have to have other things in place because you're not going to pay attention no matter how much you've experienced it in the past. That, yeah, that makes sense. And, and I want to I wanna ask you what, what we can do in addition to the um, – you know, just having the, the stop loss or the turnaround time or the kill criteria. But before before we get to that, I, I wanted to ask another question, which I think relates to the the maybe why we're not good at quitting on time. And um, you know, you talk about you reference a lot of actually in the book a lot of academic studies that relate to to finance and investment. And um, um, you know, one of them talks about how um, we, you know we tend to take gains too early, and we let losers go on too long. And I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with that. Um, but you framed it in a way that I hadn't thought about before, and it really made me think. And you talked about in poker, p- players who quit while they're ahead end up minimizing the hours when they're playing well. And at the same time, if you, I think you said, if you soldier on beyond, you know, your when you're, if you soldier on when you're doing poorly, that maximizes the time when you're playing badly. So, like, our tendency is to, you know, it's to basically play more when we're we're not playing well. And that made me think: Does that mean we 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 think we're worse at stuff than we really are? Like but that's a general tendency. <laughs> no, right? no, we think we're better at things than we actually are. Actually, uh, in general. So, um, even though we're, even though our that bias is making us do stuff longer than we should and, and having results worse than we should we, we still think we're better no we, okay. we think we're better than we are this is a different set of biases that that's causing this to happen so first of all i i, I do want to make the point like look just in the sense that i think that having some rule of thumb that's sticking to it is just always good i also don't want you to come away from this with the rule of thumb that quitting things is also always good because it, what matters is, is the thing you're sticking to worthwhile or not? 
So this is the point about like maximize the number of hours that you're playing well and minimize the number of hours you're playing poorly. Um, that's what's determining it. What's my expected value right now? If I'm in a situation where I think my expected value is low or negative, I shouldn't stay in it. If I'm in a situation where I think that it is high, it shouldn't matter much to me whether I've been winning or losing. As long as my expected value is still there, I should continue to play. So that's that issue of worthwhile versus not worthwhile, which is hard, right? Which is one of the reasons why we have, why we have things like stop losses, because we should recognize that when we're losing, we may be a very poor judge of whether we're losing because of bad luck or we're losing because of something that we're doing. So I don't want people to say, oh, I shouldn't be gritty ever. I should just quit a lot. What I want people to do is say, it, what matters is the context and, and we need to become calibrated at this decision. Sometimes sticking it out is the right choice, but not always. It's not like grit should be synonymous with character. Sticking to things because they're hard isn't a good thing if the hard thing isn't worthwhile. Right. But, but likewise, don't quit too much. So here's where we can see kind of a calibration problem. So, you know, of all the aphorisms, almost all of which are just like stick to things and you'll succeed. Try, try again, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, winners never quit. Quitters never win. There's one aphorism, which is quit while you're ahead, um, which is pro quitting. And that is terrible advice because it feeds into a bias that we have, which is exactly that to quit while we're ahead. Again, independent of the expected value. So Alex Emus has done some great work on this with retail traders, where what he's shown is that when you look at what's happening in terms of stop loss orders, uh, retail traders tend to cancel those, uh, but they cancel them to keep the position on, to hold on to it. Um, and on the flip side, uh, they'll also cancel take gain orders, but they cancel them to sell early. So, right, so you've got the, in both cases, the order is getting canceled. But in one case, it's to sell it early when you're in the gains. In other words, they're trying to quit while they're ahead before they've they've stopped out at the top. You know, they've topped out. And on the other side, they're they're sticking when they're behind. So now the question is so, sort of what's going on here? What's happening? And it has to do with um, this issue that we have that has to do with mental accounting and also what's on your ledger. Both both things. We have a mental account. And what's on our ledger? Those tend to line up, but not perfectly. Um, and it's whether we feel that we're in the losses or in the gains and the desire to take us from a state of winning to having won and our aversion to taking us from a state of losing to having lost. So, so let's think about this. If I buy a stock at 50 and it's trading at 40, as long as I haven't sold it, right? So I've got a $10 loss on paper. As long as I haven't sold it, I still have the gamble on, right? Like I'm, I can still, vol can go my way, whatever, yeah, right? right? Like I can, so I can get back to 50 as long as, as long as I keep the bet going. It's when I sell it that that goes from a loss on paper to what's called a shore loss. And this is something Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate has talked about, which is shore loss aversion. So we are averse to that moment of turning something from on paper to realized. We don't like it. So there's the stop, there's the canceling the stop loss. Again, independent of, of whether um, you think that the bet is still positive expected value, right? So in other words, what should determine whether you sell or hold at 40 is merely, would you buy it today? That should be the only thing that matters. Less history, would you buy it today? But that is not what matters. What matters to us is I've got to hold this because I need to get my money back. I actually saw a conversation between two people on Twitter where uh, somebody had recommended to somebody that they buy, I think it was Bitcoin at like 50-ish and mm -hmm. it was trading at 26 or something and the person had sold it and that was, how could you do that? Now you can't get your money back. So that's, that's yeah. a good example, right? Of like, but now it's done. Now on the reverse side, we really like to take gains on paper and turn them into realized gains. So... We may have, you know, but we buy it at 50, it's trading at 55, our take gain is six is 60, and we're canceling it to sell it at 55 because then we don't want to keep the bet on because what if it goes back to 50? Then we'll be sad, right? We want to turn those gains on paper into realized gains. So notice that this problem with turning things from on paper to shore gains or shore losses um, distorts both sides of the quitting question. It causes us to quit too early when we're ahead, which is why quit while you're ahead is such bad advice. But it causes us to stick too long 
when we're behind because we don't want to take the sure loss. We're averse to that. It, I We had a client um, when I was running my firm and quite a big, well-known client, and they had a rule where you know, they, they would look at you and say, okay, you know, based on your strategy, we expect you, you know, uh, you know, a loss of, you know, X percent would be like a two standard deviation down move, right? So th- they had a rule that said, you know, if you hit that, you know, if over, let's say a year, we had lost, you know, what they considered to be two standard deviation, we had a really bad year, then and that triggered a decision. The decision was either fire us or give us more money. And the 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 thought process was, you know, if you still believe that, you know, you've got the manager's got skill, then, you know, this is the ideal time to give them money just after a bad patch, um, you know, hopefully betting on kind of mean reversion. Um, and if you don't, then you should get out. And um, and the reverse, right? If you had a really great, you know, a, a great uh, year, then it was either, you know, uh, you know, they, they would take take money away from you. Which was which was frustrating, but um, I, I you know I, I don't know what you think of that kind of rule, but to me that seemed to illustrate you know a way of dealing with some of the biases that you talk about. Yeah, so again, this goes into the idea of kill criteria, right? Like you're you're just setting rules in advance and pre-committing to those rules, and I think that in general that's just a really good way to deal with these quitting and sticking decisions because once we're in it, once we're on a path, we're going to be really bad deciders. So this is something that Kahneman talks about, which is being in it, right, in the decision. Like the way that I like to think about being in it is I want to eat healthy, but there's an open box of chocolate sitting in front of me. (laughs) Oh, I'll just have just one. Right. Right. Like the whole box. Thank you. Um, (laughs) and, And that's kind of the problem, like once we're on a path. So what we want to do is set out uh, benchmarks for like, you know, as an example here, because you don't want to go the other way either of you know, do we think that, do we still trust the thesis? Um, these managers are, are trading a certain, you know, strategy. Um, do we think they're smart? Do we think the strategy still holds? When they told us why they were, cha- you know, they were they were doing it and they were giving us a forecast of what the fundamentals were look like or so on and so forth, did the world move against that in a way that would make us think that they didn't know what they were talking about, right? And as long as those things aren't true, then I'll stick. But if they are true, then I'll quit. Even if they were winning, I'll quit. So we have to think about it from both sides of the equation, right? So like, here's an example, right? Like if you, if you got into, let's say that you invested in people who were trading crypto and what they told you was, here's our, this is why you should invest in us. Because we think that crypto is, is first of all, going to be uncorrelated with uh, inflation. So it'll be a good hedge against inflation. And also, uh, it will be independent of what happens in the market itself. So, uh, in a in a market crash type of situation, uh, we think that that um, crypto is going to be robust in the face of that. So, let's say that they told you that that was their thesis. Now, and they're smart people. I don't I don't doubt that they're very smart people who have this thesis. Um, and now they have a down year this year. Are you supposed to invest in them again? Well, it's the question is how do you determine kind of what smart means here? It's to say. Well, was their thesis true? So we have evidence about that, right? So we now know how it behaves in a a market chaos situation. Mm -hmm. We know how it behaves when inflation is going up. So if that was the specific, they may have other reasons that they, but if those were the reasons they gave you, that that's why they were investing in it, um, that seems like a good time that you should say, it doesn't matter whether you're up or down. I think that I should be out of this, right? Um, You know, so on both sides of the equation, um, Frank Brosens, uh, f- from Taconic Capital actually told me something once that was, I thought the greatest story ever. He had, he was trading some kind of, um, swap in Japan. Um, he would know be- better exactly what it was, but it was some, <laughs> okay. it was some swap. It was some, it was some credit swap or something in Japan. Anyway, and, um, and they had a thesis about how it was supposed to behave under certain conditions. And they ended up winning like gigantic to it like crazy amount and they immediately sold their position not because they were winning but because they realized that they had no freaking idea what they were doing <laughs> because their model didn't predict what had actually happened right that they could ever win that much and so they just got out of it 
So kill criteria work on both sides of the equation. It kind of tells you, it helps you to try to figure out when are you supposed to stick and when are you supposed to quit? And it has to do with what is my model of the world? What am I expecting to see? And when I see these signals in the future, what is that telling me to do? So what are the, okay, so kill criteria are are important. And then you've also talked about the fact that you can have kill criteria and not follow them, even if you're an expert like For Ron sure. Paul. Um, yes. What or like the, me, like sometimes I would blow through my stop losses at the poker table, trust me. Um. So what, what are the, what, is there other things we can layer on to kill criteria? You talk about, you know, kind of sometimes splitting the decision, you know, the, the position is initiation maybe with the person coming in and evaluating whether you could, should continue the position because they don't have the kind of, they don't identify with it. They don't, they haven't got personal capital invested. You, you talk about the, the notion of a quitting coach, like literally a mentor that, talks to you maybe not a position by position basis but just like hey kevin you know i'm not sure the podcast thing is working out for you maybe you should do something else you know uh, can you talk about both both those things the splitting decision and the and the role of a quitting coach yeah so splitting the decision like divide and conquer and quitting coach really goes into the same category which is that you know as i said we're very bad at making these decisions when we're in it um, not just because we've already started to accrue losses or gains, which then distorts our ability to to think about what we should do going forward, but also because of, you know, sunk cost issues, like we've put time and effort and money into things uh, that we feel like we don't want to waste, right? If I quit now, I'll have wasted all of that time. Uh, endowment, we owe, we were the jet, you know, we're the owners of those ideas. Um, and that can be come very difficult for us to let go of things, how our identity grabs up to things, status quo bias. There's just a whole bunch of, there's a lot of cognitive debris that's making it very hard for us to walk away. But the thing is that that's our cognitive debris. Like my cognitive debris isn't yours. I mean, we have similar types of cognitive debris, but applied to only the things that we started, that I myself started, right? So, um, and I'm sure, Kevin, that you've had this situation like where, you you see someone who's stubbornly sticking to something and you can see very clearly from the outside looking in that they probably <laughs> ought to walk away from it. Like that probably happens to you every day. I don't know. Um, so it stands to reason that like if you're looking at other people and saying, oh, they're, they're totally stubbornly sticking to stuff here, that probably other people are looking at you and thinking the same thing. Cause it's not like, you know, none of us are that special. Right. So, um, so, okay, so then why don't you get them to help you? Like, Kevin, if you can see me so clearly and you can see, you know, and you may not be right, but you have a different perspective than I do, that maybe I'm stubbornly sticking to something and I think that I see something the world doesn't see and you just think that I'm an idiot. Like, you wouldn't use those words, but whatever, you do. And that I'm delusional and I've convinced myself that I see something that everybody else doesn't see. It would be good if I talked to you, if I was able to actually get your opinion. So this is where quitting coaches come to play. Now, the key with a quitting coach is you're going to be loath to tell me that I'm being an idiot. So I have to give you permission to do so. I have to very explicitly say, I need help with this. I'm struggling with this decision. I don't know whether I should stick or walk away. I don't want you to tell me what I want to hear when I protest and say, I know I can turn it around or, but no, but this, but this, but this, but this. You have to actually give me an honest assessment because I'm not going to be mad at you. Because I, I need you to have my long-term interest at heart as opposed to just cheerleading my own delusions, which is kind of where we are naturally. So that's what you can do in your personal you know, uh, situation. But I have talked to investors where they, you know, they have a big enough team that we're able to take a divide and conquer strategy. In other words, to say, when somebody starts something, you immediately start the debris accumulating. Right. And so as soon as you cross the starting line, you start to accumulate sunk costs. You may get in the losses. You're going to get in the losses or in the gains. You are going to have ownership. You're going to be endowed to that path that you've chosen. Your identity is often going to start to get wrapped up in that as well. It's going to become your status quo. And if we know that's the case, why don't we get somebody else to make the exit decisions? So where possible, one of the things that I, when I'm talking to ICs, um, is, uh, hey, can you make sure that the people who are choosing whether to make the investment are different than the people who are choosing whether to exit it? Do you get when pushback possible? on that? 
do you, well, what's the reaction when um, you say that? Because, you know, there's I, this kind of cult of the, sorry to interrupt, there's a cult of this, you know, portfolio manager. Um, you know, I know investment teams are typically structured where ultimately there's one person who has responsibility for both. Do you, have you had clients take that on board and, and actually yeah, change Yeah, so it depends. I mean, institutional investors are definitely open to it because they have a committee. And so I'm just saying, like, just divide the committee up. If you have enough people, have two committees, like a start committee and a stop committee. Like, um, and and that's something that people are pretty open to. Uh, the PMs, it's mixed, but most PMs are willing to do it. And what what I recommend that they do is one of two things. Um, uh, either pair with another PM. So like kind of buddy system it, right? So if you have two PMs and, and you're kind, now they're kind of going through these decisions themselves. So part of that can be setting kill criteria together as an example, which is really helpful. And then you have accountability and you're each helping each other. I think that that can be really helpful in, in that coaching. So that's not divide and conquer. I'm not saying like, if you're, if you're paired with me, you, Kevin can't make the decision for me whether to exit, but you can help me to think through it and you can hold me accountable to my kill criteria. And that's certainly going to help me as a PM. So people are, PMs are definitely super open to that. The other thing that they're really open to if they have a big enough team is just the simple thing of if a quant recommended a particular strategy for you to trade, then don't let them make the decision about whether to quit it. Have somebody else on your team do that. So the PM then is still the decision maker, but the recommenders become different. Gotcha. And that also has been something that people have been perfectly willing to accept. Well, not perfectly, but mostly willing to accept. <laughs> yeah, I thought about this a lot when reading your book because you know the strategy that I used to the firm that I I ran was was systematic. So we used models, and a lot of the the logic was to deal with the issues that you that you bring up, right? Like you can set a stop loss rule based on history. You can continually scan the universe and look for, you know, better opportunities. Um, you basically strip the emotion out of the buy and sell decision. Do you, I'm kind of curious, do, do you find yourself when you're in investment firms, do you recommend models, systematic approaches? Um, or, yeah, so let's, let's start with that. So, look, I, I don't. I don't pretend to know what's right for a particular person. I will tell you that the places that I work with, um, whether it's venture, which is the slowest, like, you know, we're investing at seed all the way through uh, options traders, uh, which is very fast cycle, um, is the more you can systematize the decision, the better off you're going to be. And what that means is that you have to be going through a very similar process in terms of the start decision. Uh, there has to be a rubric. You have to decide what you care about. You have to make particular forecasts. Uh, you have to really think about what's the, what are the facts and information that are going into the brief. What are the subjective judgments that we need to make? Um, you know, again, be very careful about writing down the thesis. Make forecasts and make sure that all of that is incredibly systematic, right? So that uh, so that you're putting order. You're taking the. You're trying to take as much of the noise out of the decision as poss possible. That obviously also allows you to be much better at closing feedback loops, which is something that I think is really important. If I forecast, if included in it is some sort of forecast of the future, as I make enough of those forecasts, I can start to see what the quality of my forecasting capability is. And since these decisions are just forecasts, that becomes incredibly important. The other thing is when a, a, an investment goes up or down. Um, instead of trying to recreate history, I, I, because I've systematized it, I can actually go look and say, how did this fit in? Did we miss something? Is there information that's not in my model that, that I might want to include going forward that I learned afterwards, so on and so forth? So it, I think it creates faster learning uh, and refinement of that. So uh, I, I, I just think that that's incredibly important. And then what goes along with that is that you can start to think much more clearly about what are going to be the post-starting decisions. Because that, that's the thing that we need to realize is that we put all this time into the decision to start and not a lot of time into the decision to stop. And when you look at even expert traders, expert investors, um, on the starting decisions, they're they're doing much better than the market. Uh, Alex Imus found, at least for institutional investors, they were about 120 bips better than the, than, than the benchmark. But on the sell side decisions, they were about 70 bips worse. That's kind of crazy when you think about it because – the buy decision should be so much harder, right? You, you could yes, literally pick well, from anything. 
you know, so the search space. I know, is, and then the sell decisions are just from what you're holding. I know, what, right? Just what, what you own. So it's nuts. It, it, yeah. Would so you the problem recommend, is. Go ahead. Please. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Go no, ahead. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> you know, would you recommend just selling kind of a slice of the portfolio that you own and just saying, "Hey, I'm smart. Well, I know I can identify good opportunities. So periodically." I'm just going to free up some capital and reinvest it back in what I know is my strength. Um, well, it would be better than the strategy. No, it would be better than the strategy people are using because what Imus was car- comparing these decisions to was random. What if you just randomly freed up capital from your portfolio in order to trade something new? Um, uh, so with the expert investors, what they were doing was looking at the tails, the extreme winners and extreme losers. That's not surprising. Uh, they weren't looking at the the whole portfolio. So it was, again, going into a heuristic as opposed to actually thinking about expected value. That being said, I think I think the real problem is this, that when you buy something, you track it. So it's constant feedback. You, you're seeing it tick up and down. And so that's that's allowing you to get this constant feedback about what the quality of that decision to, to to actually put that position on was. When you sell it, it's gone. So I don't think that people actually even think about comparing their quitting decisions, which are just selling decisions. They're selling decisions to any benchmark. Because, you know, so we know what the benchmark is when we buy. It's beta. So we can just look at if we index this, if we just index the market compared to what we actually bought, would we have done better? Okay, so everybody knows what that benchmark is, and we're always comparing to beta on on the things that we own. But on the things that we sell, as you said, you have to create your own benchmark, which would be I'm randomly freeing the capital up from my portfolio and then tracking that in some way. And we just don't even think that way because it's out of sight, out of mind. It's off, it's off the books at that point. So I don't think that we get any feedback on this. And this is the reason why, like when I'm working with institutional investors, when I'm working with PMs, I'm saying you really have to get good at this skill because I don't think you, nobody really actually understands very well how much value you're giving up by not thinking about these, these decisions. And when we go to these, this, the, the sort of more systematic approach, right? What we have to realize is that we have to systematize the risk off decisions as well. Because what happens is that when we're thinking about putting risk on, we go through this whole process, we have models, it's it's very systematic, so on and so forth. We can do things like stop losses, but what we really want to do is say, given what my predictions of the future are, which is all that an investment is, let me take a simple example. Like implied is that interest rates are going to be within a certain band. Okay, so let's say that that's an implicate, you know, that's a clear forecast that you're making that's causing you to decide to put a position on. Interest rates will be in a certain band. What has to go along with that is that you literally write down, if interest rates go above or below that band, this will be my reaction. Now, I know it seems like a distinction without a difference, because if it's already implied in the thesis, then when interest rates move out of that band, wouldn't you react to that? No, you wouldn't because you're going to keep climbing up the mountain like Jeffrey Rubin did. That This is what you have to remember, right? So try to be really, you know, think about if this is the reason that I'm putting it on, what does that mean about, say, the fundamentals, right? What does that mean about the fundamentals, which isn't the only thing you would pay attention to. That's just an example. And if those fundamentals are moving in a particular way that goes against what I was predicting that caused me to put this position on in the first place, I ought not to convince myself that now it's really cheap, which is what we end up doing, right? So, and notice that 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 also gets you out of the problem of these managers just didn't do well, so I'm going to fire them, which is, is not a particularly good reason to fire a manager, not in the short run. And we know that people lose a lot of money to that because there's regression to the mean in both directions, right? And this allows you to actually start saying like, no, what are the actual signals that tell me something about my expectancy here? And, and to start do something, doing something about it. Um, I want to, cause I, I want to be respectful of your time and, and we only have a few more minutes left. I want to maybe just talk a little bit and it relates to a lot of things you've said, but just about goal setting. And, um, we, you know, I think we're told that having goals is good. We're told that (laughs) pre-committing to those goals, telling people what you're trying to do makes it more likely that you're going to hit them. Yeah. Um, but you, you spent quite a lot of time 
in the book talking about, I don't know, maybe the dark side of goals or the downside of goals. And I, I think that's important for everyone to hear about. So could you just give us your perspective on that? Yeah. So look, this goes in the same category, right? Like in no way, shape or form am I saying that grit isn't good. Grit is necessary for success. If you are going to be successful, you better have grit because whatever it is that you're doing, that's going to be the road to success. You're going to come up against obstacles. It's going to be really hard and you have to find a way to be able to stick to it. Even so, if it's worthwhile, the thing that isn't good is to say, therefore grit is always good. That that's the thing that I'm I'm trying to get people away from. I think that Angela Duckworth's work is incredible. I think that people should go read Grit. I think it's an amazing book. And she I think she agrees with me. I don't think that she thinks that this sort of blanket application of grit is good, period, uh, is healthy for anybody. I think it's a misinterpretation of what she's saying. And we can take the same type of thing into goals. Goals are good, but not everything about goals is good. It, right, because nothing is nothing is that categorical. Well, you so talk goals. About, you, you talk about in the, this kind of unbelievable example of a woman who is running, I think, the London Marathon, and she breaks her leg, like on she, mile eight, you know, on mile eight, and finishes it. And you're thinking, wow, that's a crazy story. And then you're like, yeah, but there's a lot of them, right? There's a yeah. lot of people who break their legs and run marathons. Yeah, so Siobhan O'Keefe, I mean, this this is the thing about goals, right? Is that goals create a target for you. They create a finish line. And as you said, they, they get you to be more gritty about it, right? Like they get you to stick to it and head toward the finish line. But the problem is, again, that some finish lines aren't worth continuing on toward anymore. And the problem is once you set a finish line, when we think about what it means to be in the losses, if I have a finish line and I'm not there yet, I'm in the losses cognitively. So if I break my leg on mile eight of a marathon, I am 18.2 miles short. Doesn't matter that I ran eight miles, right? That, that doesn't, cognitively I'm in the losses. If I'm 300 feet short of the summit of Everest, I am in the losses in comparison to that finish line, right? I'm 300 feet short of my goal. Therefore, I'm in the losses. And this is something Richard Thaler talks about is that goals are graded pass fail. This is a really big problem about them. I don't, it doesn't matter that I climbed 29,000 feet. I didn't, I didn't get to the summit. So I failed. It doesn't matter that I ran 20 miles. If I didn't run 26.2 miles, I failed. So Siobhan O'Keefe, who's the woman that you're talking about, was running in the 2018 marathon. She breaks her, her fibula bone snaps on mile eight. Everybody tells her to stop the race, obviously. Like, she's got some good quitting coaches, i.e. doctors, who are like, hey, lady, stop running. Um, because this is what you lose sight of, and this is what we lose sight of even in the investing world, is that all uh, by continuing to run the race, she's she's risking all the other races that she might ever run again in her life. And by continuing to stay in investment that's no longer worth it for you. That's money and capital that you cannot free up. There's a cost to that capital. You cannot free up to go put in another opportunity that would do better. And we get so focused on wanting to get our money back or having some goal or not wanting to quit in the losses in the stock that we have that we don't move it over into something better. And this is what's happening to Siobhan O'Keefe. She's short the finish line. She's in loss, the losses. She does not want to close that mental account in the losses, so she won't quit the race. And then three other people in the London Marathon did it as well. And if you search other marathons, you'll see there's people finishing <laughs> marathons with broken bones left and right. Because there's a finish line and those goals are graded as pass-fail. And let's be honest, Kevin. When you hear this story about Siobhan O'Keefe, I know it sounds a little nuts, but isn't there part of you who's like, man, I wish I had that kind of grit? Totally. I, I, totally, I just, right? Uh, I'm like, you know, like what the, the mental, um, what's the word? The mental just Fortitude. Strength. I don't know. Toughness. Yeah. The, the, like, the pain, yeah. No, I, 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 I although I, you're yeah. Right? I'm, I, I think, well, you know, like I'm a tennis player and not I love tennis too. I'm one, a total tennis player. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll get hurt and keep playing. And, um, I played district stupid. champions chips with a broken toe this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you about that a little bit, just this, this kind of myopia, um, 
Do you think that's something that we get a little bit better at as we get older? I, I checked Wikipedia and you and I are rough, roughly the same age. Actually, we, we were both born on September 13th, making us Virgos. Oh, there you um, go. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 is it easier now as, as, I don't know, maybe just I'll ask a personal question, as you get older to, you know, you, the finish line maybe is a little bit closer and it's like, okay, it's more clear that if I'm doing something now, I'm not doing something else. And so it, A, is that, do you think that's right? And B, how, how do you, would you try to convey that in a more fundamental way to someone who's further from the finish line, like a younger yeah. person? Okay. Yeah. So I, I think there's two ways in which we probably get better at this as we're older. And let me just say, I, not based on scientific research. I'm just going to, I'm throwing, this is my opinion. I just want to say that. I think the first thing is that, you know, a, a lot of these issues have to do with, again, what your own finish line is, right? That, that time is a limited resource and we all have this limited resource. And, you know, I know it feels really bad when you quit something because you feel like you failed, but what you have to remember is that life is just way too short to be spending your time on things that aren't worthwhile. And you need to quit those things to go do things that are. Because overall, that's really what our long-term goal is, right? Is not to like grit out some horrible thing that's making us unhappy for no reason other than we think it builds character. It's to get us to somewhere, you know, that resembles a fulfilling and happy life. And so, look, if the thing you're doing is hard, but, you know, ultimately it's, it's going to get you closer to that goal of a fulfilling and happy life, you should be able to stick it out. But if it's not, you have to switch as quickly as possible because you don't have that much time. And I do think that as you get older, you become a little bit more aware of that. Um, so I, I imagine that that's helpful. But the, the other thing that I think is really helpful is that you're, I think as you get older and more experienced at things, you're better at seeing finish lines that are worth it and finish lines that aren't. Right. So you can kind of see over the obstacles to say, is this something that, that actually when I get there is going to make me happy? Right. Like I know this is really hard now, but when I'm finished, how am I going to feel? And I think having experienced these things over and over again, it's easier to see. So I've started books that I haven't finished because I've kind of realized like, you know, even when I'm done, I don't think this is going to be a good enough book. I'm not going to be that proud of it. I don't know if I'm saying something important enough. Like I'm able to sort of work through that. Whereas something like, with, ironically, with a book called Quit, you know, it's hard to write a book. There's a lot of really dark moments in it where you feel like you can't find your way through the material or out of it or figure out how to say something right or you're butchering it or whatever that stuff is. But I could see to the end of it in a way that maybe if I weren't so experienced, I wouldn't be able to. So I think it creates a little bit better taste. And that that's one of the reasons why I say when you get a quitting coach, find someone who's experienced, who's seen it before, because they're going to be able to see what that sort of more long-term outcome is supposed to be for you <clears throat> in terms of whether it's worthwhile to keep going at it. Don't just find a random person on the street, right? Find someone who's been there, done that, seen that over and over again. I mean, it's part of the value of mentorship is that. Um, and I think that that's where, that's where it can become really helpful. You know, one of the things that, um, people used to say in poker when they were, you know, coaching me and then I then started adopting for myself was poker is one long game. And it was meant to get you to realize, like, it doesn't matter if you win this particular hand, like, cause you're going to play thousands of hands over your lifetime, like tens of thousands of hands over your lifetime. Uh, what matters is again, what happens in the long run? Cause it's one long game. And I think that the more experience that you have, the, the, I, I think that that the more that you're capable of getting yourself to see the world that way. I mean, I hope. I don't know. Again, that that's completely that's not science driven. And and I will say again, one of the things that the science tells you is that on average across all people, we just stink. Like we're really bad. So we 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 do get better as we get older. Actually, wait a minute. I take it back. There is some evidence <laughs> that this true. This is true. That so, we get better um, as we get older. Yes. Well, as, as we get more experience, so I'm going to give you some evidence. I just realized it's actually, right. it's actually in my book in a footnote, um, or in an end note. Okay. There was this really cool study that was done by Colin Kammerer, along with a variety of, um, collaborators, including Richard Thaler, Nobel laureate. And it was on behavior of New York City cab drivers in the 1980s. This is a super fun study. 
And uh, so he, they collected just like thousands and thousands of trip sheets. Um, and because what they wanted to understand, so the way that cab drivers work is they rent the cab for a half, uh, for 12 hours. So they don't normally own the medallion, the, the license for the cab. And this was before Uber, right? So I had to go to you and be like, Kevin, you own the cab. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to rent it from you for 12 hours and 12 hour shifts. Now, what that means is that the, the drivers are choosing when they drive and don't drive within that the 12 hours that they have the cab rented. In other words, they're not driving for the whole 12 hours. Lucky for us, because I wouldn't want to be in the cab with the person on the 12th, 12th hour, but whatever. Um, so they just want to understand, are they optimizing their time? In other words, kind of to your point that you said before about poker players, they want to maximize the time they're playing well and minimize the time they're playing poorly. Cab drivers want to maximize the time they're playing when there's lots, lots of fares around or driving when there's lots of fares around and minimize the time that they're driving when there's no fares around. So they want to know, are they following that strategy? No, they're not. So <laughs> what they discovered was that it was pretty bad. They were actually minimizing the time that they were um, driving when fares were good. So in other words, when they saw lots and lots of fares coming in quickly, the drivers were quitting really quickly. Um, and then they were maximizing the time when the conditions were bad. In other words, when the fares were coming in very slowly, they saw that they were driving for a very long time. This was so bad that compared to an optimal strategy, they would have made 15% more if they had followed the optimal strategy and compared to random, which is kind of your point about would some investors be better just sort of selling randomly from their portfolio? Right. Um, probably uh, they would have done 8% better if they had just been like, I'm going to drive five hours a day or whatever. They would have done 8% better or eight hours a day. I'm going to drive eight. They would have made 8% more money. All right. So what was going on here? Um, well, we can kind of go back to this goal problem is that they had set an earnings goal. Let's say it was $300 in a day. And when they hit it, they stopped because they passed. Remember, goals are pass fail. Um, and when they didn't hit it, they just kept driving on forever, be, trying to hit their earnings goal. Right. Uh, right. So this yeah. wraps in f back to this. But also, this is like quit while you're ahead, keep going while you're behind, like all of these things kind of go in here. But they did what the researchers did find was that the more experienced drivers made that error less. Now, were they perfect? No, but they were better than the less experienced drivers. So there is the evidence that experience can get you better at these decisions, but you're still gonna be very, very far from optimal, which is why no matter how old you are, no matter how much experience you have, you should be trying to put get some rules in place like kill criteria, get quitting coaches, that kind of thing that are going to help you. But yes, the cab drivers got better with more experience, which I've now just remembered. <laughs> and so now I have some evidence for you that what I was saying was not made up. So there's a, there's a smidge of, of hope for, for people like, uh, people like me who are a little more seasoned. Um, Hey, yes. listen, I know, um, one of the biases we have is it's difficult to quit on time. Um, and <laughs> I, I'm struggling with that now, but I that really, is true. <laughs> I really do want to be respectful of your time and, and uh, wrap things up. So uh, I'm really glad you persevered and did not quit and finish this book. Um, it's it's oh, excellent. And, and it's one that, um, you know, there's definitely obviously lessons for, for the investment community, but for everyone in general. So um Thanks so much for taking your time and uh, being with us today. And we really wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. Thanks. Um, okay. With that, I'm going to pass it back over to Niels. Thank you so much, Annie and Kevin, for a wonderful conversation on the topic of decision-making and when to quit. Annie has a fun and easy to understand way of explaining what can be a complex topic. So I really loved this conversation. Of course, she had me cheering loudly when she said, the more you can systematize the decision, the better off you will be. Because this is, of course, trend following in a nutshell. But without knowing the why this statement makes sense, no one is likely to change their decision making. So I'm hopeful that all of you listening today took notes when she explained the reason this statement is so true. The fact that we usually don't get rewarded for quitting is something we should all internalize and perhaps change in our own lives as we pass on our experiences to the next generation. And for all of you who already love and believe in trend following, we now have new terms for a stop loss, namely kill criteria or turnaround time. 
and stories to go along with them that we can use in our investor conversations. Make sure you go and follow Annie's and Kevin's work and make sure you go and get a copy of their most recent books because as you can tell from today's conversation, some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed enough on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.